Our next author, Wayson Choi's first novel, The Jade Peony, spent six months on the Globe and Mail's national bestseller list and shared the Trillium Book Award for a uh, best book in 1995. Uh, All That Matters, described as a companion novel to The Jade Peony, won the Trillium Book Award in 2004. Please welcome Wayson Choi, who will be reading from All That Matters. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read standing up because I will pitch forward. <laughs> and there's nobody comfortable enough. And Ian, you're not... Uh, going to catch me. (laughs) But uh, Ian's book is so powerful and moving, I recommend it to you. And I also recommend that you might get a hold of this copy, which is free for all of you attending, and it tells the history of all the award winners. And uh, it will be, I think, wonderful to have a history that matters. I wanted to say that when I won the uh, uh, the Trillium Award, it actually launched me because I was co-winner with Margaret Atwood. And uh, she wrote a book of poems and I wrote a novel and they decided to uh, give us both the prize. And when people read in the paper that Margaret Atwood had won with somebody unknown, they didn't know I had enhanced the prize. <laughs> but they did know that Margaret Atwood was going to let me ride on her name, and she was very generous. She took half the money. (laughs) There's a limit to generosity. (laughs) But that's what writers need. I just want to say one more thing, that prizes like this, which earn the respect of the community, and those who are nominated are certainly rewarded with the publicity and the respect this kind of award garners. Periodically during the award seasons, I hear newspaper people and very sophisticated people say, should we have so many awards and all this stuff? Well, let me tell you, if we who write and spend the many hours staring at a blank screen and a blank page trying to create something out of nothing, if you take one award away, I will kill. (laughs) Furthermore, There will never be enough awards for the books that were not nominated. And we have to remember that. So if you're thinking of leaving money to an award, do it. And I congratulate all those who are here and who understand that uh, reading matters. I'm reading from All That Matters. Uh, The JP is in its 28th printing. And this one's only going into its eighth or ninth, counting the uh, paperback edition. So I gotta hustle this one. (laughs) It's, we have to know how to sell. It is a companion to all that, uh, I mean, to the Jade Peony. And it has to do with the older brother who is barely mentioned in the first book. There were four siblings. But at one point, I had written a section in the Jade Peony of uh, the older brother, and it turned out a wise uh, agent and editor. Uh, Certainly, my agent suggested to me that maybe we could remove the older brother because it seemed to be about the paternal side of Chinatown. He was the firstborn, and he was a son. And the others were raised by the maternal side of Chinatown because, of course, the first son was what mattered. And more than that, I think uh, I thought I had written all that I would and then uh, Denise Bukowski, my agent, said to me, you know what, take this part off and it'll work better and you can do your next book on this one. So finally there came a time when people said, tell us more. I sat down, faced the blank screen and here I am. All that matters. The opening quote is, the master said with words, all that matters is to express truth, the Analects of Confucius. The opening, beginnings. When I hear the sea wind blowing through the streets of the city in the morning, I can still feel my father and the old one, Popo, 
together, lifting me up to perch on the railing of a swaying deck. Still feel the steady weight of father's palm braced against my chest and Popo's thickly jacketed arm locked safely around my legs. I was three then in 1926, but I can still recall their shouting in the morning chill, Cam Kim, Cam Kim, and their voices thin against the blasts of salty wind. Hi, look, Im San, look at Gold Mountain. Hi, la, hi, la, look, look. I saw in the distance from the ship the mountain peaks, and my toes curled with excitement. As I pressed a hand over each small ear to dim the assault of squawking gulls, fragments of living sky swirled and plunged into the waste, spewing from the ship's belly, and the sun broke through. All at once, the world grew more immense and even, than, even stranger than I could ever have imagined at three. I ducked my head to one side and burrowed blindly into Popo's jacket. Father plucked me off the rail and put me down to stand up by myself. Popo did not stop him. We are near Gold Mountain, she said. Her Toysan words shouted above other excited voices. Straighten up, Kan Kim. My back stiffened. I watched as Father clutched the rail to hold our place against the surging crowd. He looked ready for anything. I put my own hands around the middle rail and threw my head back and tried to look as bold and as unafraid as Father. Popo glanced behind her, a wrinkled hand shakily held onto my shoulder. I shouted to her to look at the swooping gulls, but she did not hear me. As the prow rose and crashed and the Empress of Japan surged into the narrow inlet, gusts of bitter wind stung my eyes. At last, to greet the approaching Vancouver skyline, the ship blasted its horn. Look there, Kan Kim, shouted Father, way over there. I looked. Along a mountain slope, a black line was snaking its way towards the city. See, Father said, kneeling down to shout above the chaotic machinery, clanking away in the ship's belly. I told you there would be trains. I laughed and jumped about until the sea air chilled my cheeks. The old one bent down to lift a thick coat collar around my neck, and the air tasted of burning coal. Listen carefully, Can Kim, father said. Can you make out the train whistle? I listened, but I was not thinking of trains. Grandmother had told me the story that dragons screeched and steamed out of hidden mountain lairs, sweating, scaly dragons whose curl curving bodies plunged into the sea and caused the waters to boil and the wind to scorch the faces of intruders until their eyes, unable to turn away, burned with tear tears. The wailing finally reached my ears. The black line turned into freight cars, headed towards the city's row of warehouses and jutting docks. The train engine gave another shriek. In response, the ship blew its horn again. A shawl of seabirds lifted skyward. Ship and train and sky were racing to reach the same point of land, it seemed to me, and people behind us applauded. Father raised his hand to shield his eyes against the dancing sunlight. We're here, Mother, Father said to Popo. I said to myself, here, and gripped the rail even harder. The train now disappeared behind a shoreline of low buildings, and with my eyes following the great bellows of smoke, I heard clearly the echoing screech of wheels. The cries of a dragon, said Popo. Father said, just the train coming to a stop, Kim Kim. But the old one's voice was so certain that I held my breath. Thank you.